Houston Professor of Spiritual Theology and Professor of History and Christianity at Regional College, Vancouver, British Columbia. He is a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a past president of the American Society of Church History. He's the author of three major books, The Spirit of Early Evangelicalism, 2018, The Evangelical Conversion Narrative, 2005, and John Newton and the English Evangelical Tradition, 1996, as well as numerous essays and articles. We're looking forward to hearing what Professor Heinmarsh has to say. He'll be speaking for approximately 40, possibly more minutes, and then from there we'll move into question and answers. Thank you very much. In the middle of incredible sorrow. 
Amazing grace in the middle of incredible sorrow. It was on those same North Atlantic seas 250 years earlier that John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, first cried out to God for mercy in the midst of a storm that threatened to kill all on board a foundering ship bound for England. Newton wrote Amazing Grace some years afterward when he was settled at his parish church in the English Midlands as an Anglican minister. But the hymn, the hymn has endured through two and a half centuries to become today a powerful symbol of hope in the midst of tragedy. It is somewhat surprising, perhaps, that a hymn that in its opening stanza expresses robust gratitude for having received grace that saved a wretch like me has become a heartfelt prayer for grace. Perhaps it's the acknowledgement in this hymn that there is grace for the human condition, with all its wretchedness, lostness, blindness, that helps singers past and present reckon with inconsolable loss when this comes. There are some hymn book editors that have been embarrassed by John Newton's use of the word wretch in the second line of the hymn, and they've offered revisions, such as Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saves Someone Like Me, or Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved and Strengthened Me. And yet it's not these versions that are sung in the midst of tragedy, but people experience real, incomprehensible sorrow and are faced with wretchedness. Indeed, the hymn has figured prominently in times of intense national grieving in America, time and again where there has been profound anguish. After the Space Shuttle Challenger burst into flames on television in 1986, the American nation for an amazing grace played in the memorial service for the astronauts. After terrorists explored a bomb at Oklahoma City Federal Building in 1995, killing 168 people. Amazing Grace was again carried to church services by television news programs. In 2001, immediately after the terrorist attacks on September the 11th, a spontaneous candlelight vigil began in Union Square, and people again, again began to sing Amazing Grace.
She recorded Amazing Grace for Apollo Records on December the 10th, 1947, and her soulful version of the hymn was played on the radio in the immediate post-war years and helped move Amazing Grace into the popular consciousness once and for all. years of age, 
when his mother died. His father, a stern ship commander, was no substitute for his mother. And as a boy, he always felt a certain fear, he said, in his father's presence. When his father remarried, he felt like an unwanted orphan in a strange family. And his experience of boarding school under a severe schoolmaster deepened his sense of alienation during quite tender years from age 7 to age 11. Despite his determination to be a devout young boy, he found he kept violating his own sensitive conscience, unable to live up to the pious resolves that he made repeatedly. The 19th century biographer Leslie Stephen thought Newton exaggerated the sins of his youth, transferring the language of the confessional to the press, noticing the tendency of the convert to pour excessive scorn on his pre converted self. Well, his father began to take him on training voyages to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, and during his adolescence, he gradually abandoned his Christian commitments. He became what he called an infidel, a free thinker, and a libertine what we would say maybe a convinced agnostic living without any religious moral constraints. By the time he was 17, he had by the fashionable deism of the third Earl of Shaftesbury, and with it a refined highbrow skepticism of all things Christian. He was a little bit pretentious. Around the same time, he fell in love with a young married Catholic when he visited the home of family friends at Chatham and Kent. I suspect there was a warmth of affection in this family was missing in his own. His father had plans to set him up a business in the West Indies, but he stayed on with the Catholics until quite literally that ship had sailed. He repeated the same thing a year later. He said his motto at the time was never to deliberate. He had not yet grown a prefrontal cortex, as we say. If his mother's death was the devastating blow of his childhood, the experience that shattered his late adolescence was being kidnapped, press gang into the Navy at age 18. His father got him promoted to a kind of junior officer, but there was no escape in the Navy. War was threatening in France, and Newton's ship saw action in the North Sea. When the ship was near the Kentish coast, he obtained leave to visit the Catholic family again, and yet again he overstayed, and returned to the ship in disfavor. When the ship prepared to depart for a long tour to the East Indies, he attempted to desert altogether, going absent without leave at Plymouth. This time he was captured and returned to the ship in irons, whipped in the presence of the whole crew, disgraced, demoted to the status of a common seaman, subject to the brutal conditions before the mast. He had previously abused the common sailors as a junior officer now. Now he was at their mercy. As he watched the English coastline recede, he felt pretty dark. He had dark thoughts of murder and suicide, he says. Here was a young man who needed grace and could have some sympathy. The boy who lost his mother, the careless teenage, teenager who got himself into serious trouble and could see no way out. We can imagine his desperation to escape conditions on board as the naval ship left European waters and headed down the coast of northwest Africa. Unexpectedly, he managed to be exchanged for a sailor on a Guinea ship at Madeira. He was free of the Navy, but now as he descended the ship's ladder, he literally dropped down into the slave trading economy of the first British Empire, into the belly of the beast. The transatlantic slave system operated in the background for most Europeans, but every time one drank a cup of tea, there was a long and bloody supply chain that put the sugar on the table whether one recognized it or not. At 19 years of age, Newton began working on the ships themselves that purchased and transport slaves to the West Indies and America to support this economy. For six months, he was ship steward, as the Guinea men called, at slave distribution points along the West African coast. He dropped down, if you like, further into the maw of the system, when he then contrived to stay on the coast in Sierra Leone and to work at one of these slave distribution points, or factories as they called them. During the next two years, he suffered illness, probably malaria, abuse at the hands of his employer, near starvation, exposure half naked and in chains, and constant ridicule, and he marked this as a low point in his story. I think he knew he could easily have died alone and unloved, far from home, and, and should have. Although the slave trader had become a slave, this did 
not yet awaken in him an obvious sympathy for the African slaves themselves whom he encountered, and it did not yet lead him to question the profound inhumanity of the slave system. Nor did he yet see through, see through the attitude of European racial superiority that made black slavery appear acceptable. As for other Europeans, his awakening to these prejudices would come later. Eventually, he was rescued by an English merchant ship, the Greyhound. The crew returned to England via the coast of Brazil and Newfoundland, but encountered a severe North Atlantic storm in the winter of 1748. On March the 21st, Newton was awakened in the middle of the night to find the ship was breaking apart and filling fast with water, a man already swept overboard. Newton muttered his first prayer for mercy in many years, but then caught himself by surprise to find that he was praying at all. Who am I to pray? When the ordeal was over, he and most of the crew survived the storm, but were left with very little food or water and a ship out of repair. They were still in great danger for some time yet. Newton began to read the Bible and other devotional books. By the time the ship at length reached Ireland, he considered himself no longer an infidel. He was a believer. In his diary, he would always thereafter remember the 21st of March as the anniversary of his conversion, or at least the beginning of his conversion. Indeed, the very last entry he made in his diary as an 80-year-old man commemorated this event. With a shaky hand, he wrote, um, not well able to write, but I endeavor to observe the return of this day with humiliation, prayer, and praise. Again, he knew he properly should have died as a wretch, and it was only undeserved grace that he survived this near-death experience of all. It was grace also that this near-death experience had provoked, had pricked his religious conscience. It is this story of Newton's conversion in the midst of near shipwreck on the Atlantic that often makes it into hymnal companions as an illustration of the autobiographical dimension of amazing grace. And yet, in some accounts, it is made to appear as though Newton were wiping the brine from his forehead as he wrote the hymn, with the breakers still crashing over the gunwales, or even worse, with slaves below deck. This is not the case. Of course, the Greyhound was not a slave ship, and however well the hymn expresses Newton's own experience of redemption, he wrote it some 25 years later, long after he had left the sea, in the context of day-to-day -day ministry as an evangelical parish priest. The near shipwreck in 1748 marked a spiritual awakening, certainly, but it was only the beginning. Newton would often look back and observe that his spiritual progress was slow, and he contrasted with people who seemed to have a sudden transformation like Colonel Gardner. His knowledge of spiritual things, he said, only increased little by little, like the gradual dawning of the day, his favorite metaphor. My first beginnings in the religious course were as faint as can be well imagined, he recalled. There would be relapses, renewed repentance, and a long path to spiritual maturity. Indeed, for the next six years, Newton would make four voyages on slave ships, one as first mate, three as captain. He kept a professional journal as a captain in the slave trade from 1750 to 54, and he also kept a spiritual diary beginning in 1751. In his own life then, and symbolically, almost symbolic of the whole culture, these were like two overlapping tectonic plates, and we could feel the profound seismic tension. We can see in his spiritual diary the course of his theological reading, his spiritual resolves, his devotional practices, his sincere prayers, his gratitude for self-preservation, and all his efforts at beginning to be a serious Christian. But in his captain's logbook, we can read the details not only of maritime navigation, shipboard discipline and management, but also the routine business of cruel slave trading reduced to commodity transactions. According to his logbook, he bought and imprisoned 468 African men, women, and children on board his ships, of whom 68 died on his watch while in African waters or on the Middle Passage, and the rest he delivered into the deadly plantation system in the West Indies, 
where it's estimated that probably one-third died within the first three years. He did this while simultaneously taking the first steps to place his personal faith in Christ. This blood was on his hands, and it was a long time till he began to reckon with it. He was then self-deceived as he later confessed. He said, custom, example, and interest had blinded my eyes. He would later, of course, make a significant contribution to anti-slavery and abolition, but we must reckon with the extent to which he, along with most Europeans, was morally self-deceived in the 1750s. We are responsible to tell the truth about the past and to exercise judgment. There's a tendency today to do so from a place of assured moral superiority. We imagine we would have been on the right side of history if we lived back then. I wonder if we could be so sure. Is it not naive to think that we are now today finally immune from moral self-deception, even on a grand scale? Things written in letters too large to read in our own lives? If something is accepted by everyone, custom, and everyone else is doing it, example, and it is to my benefit, interest, then we too are in danger of self-deception. Sadly, this is human nature. There are so many examples in history of good people swept up in prejudice and then conspiring with evil. It's not too hard to imagine, actually. Majorities routinely oppress minorities and tell themselves convincing lies to justify this. So the need, I think we can learn from this, is for chastened self-criticism. It's a salutary lesson from this period. In 1788, Newton wrote the abolitionist Richard Phillips. I hope God has forgiven me, but I often walk softly all my days in the remembrance of what I have been and what I have done. I wonder if it's good for all of us to, if we have some self-knowledge to walk softly all our days. Still, to the deeper sense now, we must emphasize our first point. John Newton, remember our first point, John Newton is a man, was a man who needed grace. He really did, even more than he realized for some time. He would need forgiveness not only for blasphemy, coarseness, disobedience, and his personal vices as a young man, but so much more for his complicity in the suffering and deaths of these precious women, men, and children who were his cargo. The philosopher of totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt, who has thought deeply about radical evil, wrote not only about self-deception and so on, but also about what she calls the problem of permanence. The problem of permanence. And this arises whenever we act in the world. We cannot take our actions back. They cannot be undone. For her, the only answer to the problem of permanence was forgiveness. We cannot take our actions back, but when we reckon what we have done, we can seek forgiveness and make amends where we can. There is nothing else. By the late 1780s and 1790s, Newton's remorse and repentance was public, as was his political action on behalf of the abolitionist cause. In his influential thoughts upon the African slave trade in 1788, he wrote, I am bound in conscience to take shame to myself by a public confession, which whoever sincere comes too late, the problem of permanence, to prevent or repair the misery and mischief which I have formerly, to which I have been accessory. I hope it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. In 1789 and 1790, Newton gave detailed evidence to the Privy Council and the House Select Committee, evidence that would help break down the slave trade. When he came to read the printed minutes, he took out his pen and added his name to the title page in his own handwriting. He reached for his pen again once he had finished reading the testimony, and at the conclusion he wrote, I make no apology for speaking publicly against this trade. I dare not. Let me silent my conscience and speak loudly, knowing what I know, knowing what I know. Nor could I expect a blessing on my ministry, though I should speak of the sufferings of Jesus till I was hoarse. 
Finally, he adds one more note at the bottom. A quotation from Genesis 4, verse 10. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto thee from the ground. He was quoting Genesis 4, 10 of the blood of Abel, who was murdered by Cain. But he was thinking of those who suffered and died because of what he himself had done. When exactly did John Newton come to recognize that what he had done was not just disagreeable but morally repugnant? By 1788, his repentance was public. But we know he had already been speaking privately with Wilberforce and others about abolition. We don't really have the records to say definitively, but there are hints at least that Newton's awareness and private remorse on a kind of trajectory increased over time from when he left the slave trade in 1754 through 1788. Um, when he wrote publicly against the trade, given his growing connection with anti-slavery advocates. Already in 1764, when he published his autobiographical narrative, he included the comment, during the time I was engaged in the slave trade, I never had the least scruple as to its lawfulness. And he said that he prayed that the Lord would provide him a more humane calling. I wonder if this clause during the time I was engaged in the trade, may well imply that after he left the slave trade, he actually did have such scruples. We had a paper um, yesterday from John Coffey, who has explored other hints of Newton's um, uh, anti-slavery sentiments and contributions during this period. At the end, we don't know for sure. We don't quite know how to account for Newton's silence, except to say that he shared in the moral assumptions of his generation of Europeans and was subject to its social pressures. And we know that anti-slavery activism prior to the 1780s was the rare exception rather than the norm. Perhaps the real historical question is why anti-slavery succeeded at all as a social movement. This is the period when social movements studied by sociologists begin. Why anti-slavery succeeded given what we call custom, example, and self-interest. Slavery has existed in most societies throughout history, and what sociologists call a plausibility structure powerfully reinforced the status quo. Thankfully, historians have done much work to trace the various factors that contributed to an epochal sea change of attitudes in Britain in the late 18th century. One factor, among others, is certainly the evangelical faith of many humanitarians, such as the so-called saints in Parliament, especially William Wilberforce and those who gathered around him. But I would like to pause here to emphasize the important role that Afro-Atlantic peoples themselves play, not as victims, but as agents in their own emancipation. These are stories that need to be told. If Newton transported 468 slaves, then it matters that we count, and that the final digit is eight and not seven. For the 468th slave could have been an Olaura Equiano, or a Phyllis Wheatley, or Rebecca Crotton, with his or her own individual experiences, their hopes and fears, a particular, his, particular history in a particular family and people group in West Africa, and an utterly unique experience of the suffering of forced migration across the Atlantic and slave labor in the West Indies and America. The evident humanity of uh, Ignatius Sancho, born on the slave ship in 1729, the famous musician Ignatius Sancho, the direct denunciation of the slave trade by Okumna Utalba Cubano in 1787, the published autobiographies of James Albert Ukausa Gloriasa in 1772, and famously Olauda Equiano in 1789. These writings, these examples, with their evident learning, dignity, self-respect, all these Afro-Atlantic figures were key agents, not just victims, in building anti-slavery sentiment. And they spoke, like Phil Sweetley in America, for all those who had no voice. But I would like to make just one connection here to the spirituality of Amazing Grace and the evangelical ministry of John Newton as this emerged in the 1760s and beyond. For several of these Afro-Atlantic figures, it was their embrace of 
Christianity and of an evangelical form of Christianity that offer not only a sense of dignity and spiritual equality with their white masters, but also that provided the language for them to protest their conditions. This was evident in the first mass turning of African Americans to Christianity on the island of St. Thomas in the Caribbean, where the Moravian inspired African led revival included lay evangelists such as the freed slave Rebecca Crotton who stood her ground in a hostile courtroom, protesting the atrocities of the Blancan, asserting her moral superiority in a way that inspired other Afro-Caribbeans. Embracing an evangelical form of Christianity provided the language to protest that white planters were not being real Christians, not being true Christians, like William Wilberforce's later tract on real Christianity. They were able to say, we are more Christian than you. If on St. Thomas there was a sense among the slaves and free blacks and creoles of spiritual dignity and even moral superiority with the whites, but the institution of slavery itself seemed beyond challenge, there were those in the next generation who would press this language further. In Olauda Equiano's narrative, there is a uh, critical section in his famous account of the very traumatic conditions of the Middle Passage where he says, O ye, say to his readers, O ye nominal Christians, might not an African ask you, learn this from your God? And he continues for several lines to press his point home eloquently. But note that this language critiquing his readers as nominal Christians is drawn straight from the lexicon of the evangelical revival. Countless were the sermons by John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield and Philip Doddridge and John Newton that challenged women and men to consider whether they were real Christians or merely nominal Christians in name only. Amazing Grace and the only hymns were the testimony of those who had come to a heartfelt personal faith in Christ as the one thing necessary. I think these are seeds. This would be... Um, necessary but not sufficient conditions. These are the seeds that are there for the universal affirmation of the full dignity, equality, and worth of every human being. And I think in a way the later history of Amazing Grace bears witness to this as that seed grows. Well, we cannot say that Amazing Grace was written in 1773 to express remorse specifically for John Newton's sinful past as a slave trader. He did understand that we are all universally, desperately, in need of grace, and that our sinful condition runs deep. He also understood that conversion was not a matter of one and done. We need grace all the way to the end, and we will never be entirely undeceived. He wrote about this. But the closer we get to the burning radiance of Christ, the more we are exposed to the light and salt of the fire. Newton described grace as something that grows in a believer's life over time. It's an active agent in the believer's life. And he described someone growing in grace. And he said he knows that his heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, but he does not, indeed he cannot know at first the full meaning of that expression. Grace is necessary to undeceive us. But there is, over time, there is change. Much has been forgiven him, therefore he loves much, therefore he knows how to forgive and to pity others. Again, he continues, the Lord has long been teaching him this lesson by a train of dispensations, and through grace he can say he has not suffered so many things in vain. His heart has deceived him so often that he is now in good measure weaned from trusting to it, taught to go to the Lord at once for grace and help at every time of need. Thus he has brought God in himself and in the grace that it is in Christ Jesus. This is his picture of growing maturity. He would have been the first to say that he needed grace and forgiveness all his life right to the end. To grow in Christ is only to become more and more aware of this need for grace. As he entered his 60s and joined with others in the abolition campaign, the horror of what he had done touched him deeply. As he wrote to a friend in 1786, I cannot contemplate the subject very nearly without a degree of abhorrence that affects my spirits. 
After Newton left the sea and left the slave trading spot, spent about a decade as a customs agent in Liverpool in his 30s. Self-taught, he studied uh, theology and ancient languages. I think he even learned Syriac, which is actually amazing. And he became active as an evangelical layman, sharing in the wider revival movement associated with Wesley and Whitfield. After many ecclesiastical dangerous toils and snares, he was finally ordained in 1764 and settled here in Olney as a curate when the ink was still drying on his dramatic autobiography and authentic narrative. For 16 years, he was the minister here for a town parish of about 2,000 people. Later, he would move to a city edifice in London across the Bank of England. Here at Olney, he established a variety of additional meetings that became very popular, and there was something of a significant global revival. He also made hymns immediately a vital part of his ministry. He noted in his diary at the beginning of 1765, we now have a fixed little company who come to my house on Sabbath evening after tea. We spend an hour or more in prayer and singing and park between six and seven. It's over here. A month later, he was giving out hymn books to the children and employing someone to teach them to sing. During much of the 1770s then, Newton regularly wrote a hymn for the prayer meeting and often used the hymn as a basis for a small lecture. This was the origin of Newton's contributions to the only hymns, a collection that went into multiple editions on both sides of the Atlantic before the end of the century. The hymn book was to have included an equal number of hymns from his friend and neighbor, the poet William Cooper. But the onset of Cooper's third and serious depression left him unable to contribute more than about a fifth of the total. The hymn writing task for John Newton was an extension of his preaching ministry. Some hymns arose from very specific occasions, situations in the parish, such as a funeral hymn he wrote in February 1774 after the death of the parishioner Betty Abram. While the occasion of the hymns was often local, the sentiments were universal. That's part of his genius as a hymn writer. He wrote in the transparently simple language of the representative I, expressing exemplary sentiments for his people. Yet at the same time, he could put their very local lives on a large eschatological canvas of God's saving works. Amazing Grace originally appeared in the Old Age hymn book under the text, 1 Chronicles 17, 16 and 17, and it bore the title, not Amazing Grace, but Faith's Review and Expectation. It was when we realized that Amazing Grace was an exposition of Scripture that we could remember a second story. We remember that John Newton needed grace, but there's a second story behind the hymn more immediately, not only that John Newton needed grace, but that uh, King David of Israel needed grace. Here was a murderous and adulterous king with blood on his hands, whose contrition was recorded in the Psalter and the 51st and other songs, and who became a man after God's own heart. Then the prophet Nathan announced God's gracious promises to David, the Davidic covenant. This was a matter to David of some amazement. It was an amazing grace. In his manuscript diary, Newton regularly recorded the text upon which he preached, and this text appears in his diary for the 1st of January, 1773. New Year's Day was a solemn day for Newton for reflecting on the passing of time and the certain approach of death one more year. Every year he took time to report his age, reflect upon the days gone by and the shortness of the days ahead. Or in other words, he paused to think about the ways in which grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. He looked back and he looked ahead. It was a version of what Jesuits and Puritans called an exam, making an exam. It was one of Newton's most consistent spiritual disciplines over the course of his lifetime. This is what he wrote in his diary in the beginning of um, 1773. Friday, the 1st of January, this is the ninth New Year's Day I have seen in this place. I have reason to say the Lord crowned every year with his goodness. I am now in the 49th year of my age, and they expect in the course of a few years at most to go whence I shall no more return. Nor have I a certainty of continuing here a single year or even a month or a day. May thy grace 
grace keep me always waiting till my appointed change shall come. Aware of the sands of time, aware every day was a gift, he conducted faith review and expectation. He preached a special sermon in the morning to the congregation and in the evening to the young people. In an unusual local tradition, the young people's service involved the local Baptist and independent congregations as well. There was a heightened expectation that these would be times of seriousness and spiritual sensitivity in the parish and for these occasions we can also go to heaven. His diary continues and he says, um, I preached this forenoon from 1 Chronicles 17, 16, and 17. And he talks about singing a hymn. This is the original setting for Amazing Grace. There's one more piece of evidence that helps us fix Amazing Grace in its context here. Make sure we got the anniversary right. Um, in addition to the manuscript diary, there are dozens of Newton's sermon notebooks that are extant. And one of these notebooks is at Landon Palace Library in London and dates from 1773. Marilyn Rouse noticed that it includes the text of a sermon by Newton on 1 Chronicles 16, uh, 17, verses 16 and 17. And the structure of the sermon is the same as the hymn. There's all sorts of verbal similarities, so we got the date right. <laughs> Let's look a little just at the original hymn text. The first three stanzas reflect on a climactic evangelical conversion in the past. The initial explanation of amazing grace invites immediate congregational consent and a kind of release of energy. The following parenthetical response, how sweet the sound, enacts, it performs the amazement just proclaimed, almost like an interlocutor or a whisper, we said yesterday, and focuses the whole line back upon the word grace. Then the balance of the first stanza lays out the stark contrast that evoked the initial cry of wonder. The lines I once was lost, but now found is blind, and now I see match cadences with contrasting images, and the simple antitheses are expressed in equally simple monosyllables. The second stanza brings changes on the thrice repeated word grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace by fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear in the hour I first believed. It recalls, it, it loops back to the opening explanation while developing the paradox in evangelical theology that the preaching of the law and the remorse that it provokes is a part of the very grace that brings release from sin. The precision of the hour I first believed pinpoints the experience of grace as climactic and central in the same way that the earlier dialectical images did. So by the end of the second stanza, the singers have been led to express exemplary sentiments. The amazement, the sweetness, the preciousness of divine grace. Of the danger and toil of stanza three, both Newton and his poor parishioners had seen much. But the last half of the stanza becomes a central pivot, a hinge upon which the whole hymn turns. You're going to fold your copy of the text in half. This is where the priest should be. Um, we turn with faith to face the future. The past is gathered up into the word grace. Grace has led me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. This is exactly the structure of the middle part of Newton's sermon on this text, which is subdivided before conversion, at conversion, and then since we were enabled to give up our names to him. Following the sermon outline, the last three stanzas trace the path of the believer respectively through the balance of this life. Remember, grace will lead me home. Well, the balance of this life, as long as life endures, and then through death, when this mortal life shall cease, and then to the end of the world itself, the earth shall soon dissolve like snow. It's a, five, uh, a strong final quatrain which could draw the circle from the earth in its final heating, melting consumption with the simple reassurance of that small word, mine. God who called me here below will be forever mine. The poorest lace maker in Olney could know that her life was significant in God's cosmic purposes for all of history. 
We need to take seriously the fact, of course, that this is based on the biblical passage in which King David responds in amazement to the prophet's message that God will maintain David's line and his kingdom forever. David went before the Lord and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that has brought me hitherto? We are actually singing a paraphrase of the words of King David when we sing Amazing Grace. This is King David's song first, and then ours, by analogy, King David says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. The passage that Newton was expounding is actually one of the high points of biblical theology. And Newton saw in this text the anticipation of Jesus Christ as the greater son of David, the one who is presented as the fulfillment of these promises to David in the genealogies of the Gospels. So there's a deep vein of biblical theology that roots this hymn in salvation history and in biblical faith. So John Newton needed grace. King David needed grace. That's what this um, hymn was expounding, is that biblical theology. But finally, um, we all need grace. What is the after history here? The only hymns were reprinted often, and individual hymns were reissued in magazines and other hymnals in England. Amazing Grace was not, however, picked up in many other hymn collections. It appeared in an upmarket collection by Lady Huntington, who had her chapel at Bath, her aristocratic chapel, and it appeared in her collection in 1780, and in a Moravian collection in 1789. In both cases, there are associated tunes, and uh, a common meter hymn like Amazing Grace could, however, be sung to any number of tunes. But do we know what it was sung to here? We're not entirely sure. The Lady Huntington version, the first one I'm aware of, uh, was linked to a tune called Hepzibah that has a fuguing element and a Handelian in the last half of each stanza that's considerably more complex than the shape note tune in New Britain for the American South, to which it is universally linked today. Um, this is the tune Hepzibah, and this is a 16-voice choir sight reading it. Testimony. 
In one hymn book I examined among the 8,000, I didn't examine all 8,000, in the Benson collection at Princeton, Amazing Grace was heavily marked up, and the marginalia included the comment in the scribbled hand, Brother B's favorite. In this context, Amazing Grace became associated with its tune, New Britain, printed in the Columbian Harmony, and then other oblong uh, tune books, such as Southern Harmony, uh, beginning in 1829. New Britain is still probably the most important shape note tune in the Sacred Heart tradition. And uh, very rough shape note singing, and the uh, melody is carried in the middle register. After the Civil War, in the urban revivalism of the Gilded Age, Amazing Grace was included in northern denominational hymn books and the revivalist song books associated with the evangelists such as Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey, the song leader. It was in this era that Edwin Othello Excel added a now common final verse when we've been there 10,000 years. This final stanza was one of more than 70 stanzas that have evolved as a part of the old hymn, Jerusalem, My Happy Home. I like to think that he stole it, thinking nobody would miss it. <laughs> this arrangement by Excel gradually drove most other editions of the hymn from the field, at least in America, became the standard form of Amazing Grace, as most people would encounter it in the 20th century. So, Newton's hymn had traveled from the Dutch Reformed Congregation of New York in 1787 to the emotional camp meetings of the western frontier to the sentimental urban revivals of the late 19th century. All of this was a long way from only in the 18th century. But the hymn would have further yet to travel in the 20th century. Gospel music historians have traced the history of the hymn among African American churches. As one historian writes, no song so moves black congregations as Amazing Grace. It traces history back before and after emancipation. Perhaps some of you have seen the archival footage recently released in a documentary of Aretha Franklin's almost 10 minute emotional interpretation of Amazing Grace at New Temple Missionary Baptist Church in 1972, accompanied by James Cleveland and his gospel choir, right there in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles that was still marked by riots and unrest. It's a deeply moving interpretation. She brought the standing room only congregation to its feet and tears streamed down the cheeks of many who witnessed the moment. It was powerful. Steve Turner and others have traced the hymn as it's figured in popular music, as the hymn pushed into the commercial marketplace and into the wide popular consciousness, and we've looked at some of that. The hymn had further yet to travel. The final and most unexpected and spontaneous development was to find, looping back to where we began, the countless individuals and groups have turned to this song in the time, times of deepest crisis, in times of unspeakable suffering and inconsolable loss. It has pulled together whole nations in times of grief. When all hope is lost, we sing Amazing Grace. The tune New Britain is not based on the full seven note scale, but the raw five note pentatonic scale that is so central to folk and roots music blues, jazz, gospel. This no doubt has contributed to the universal appeal of the hymn today. Another reason though why the hymn perhaps has been adopted easily into a secular context, so different from the world of John Newton, is that God is nowhere mentioned in the hymn except in the second last line of the now common final stanza, no less days to sing God's praise. The hymn can be sung as a prayer for grace, and in principle could be sung by anyone. At least that is how it seems to have been received. In poetic terms, Newton certainly intended grace as a method in. The name of this attribute stands poetically in place of the thing. It's God, and it's God's divine grace. Jesus Christ was full of grace. In secular 20th century, I think grace is more like a personification. We appeal to grace as to a person, an abstract idea that we're addressing, and the hope of grace the experience of grace that is celebrated, the mysterious giftedness of life in the midst of death. I know that in my own life, in times of bitter grief, uh, there's a paradoxical sense 
while feeling the loss, there's a paradoxical sense of the giftedness of life itself. Grief and gift are often closely related as two sides of the same coin. When we lose someone we love, we realize and crush the contingency of the world, the sheer undeserved gift that their life was and might not have been, and we feel the negative space of the positive gift. We see the chair but not the sitter. Time itself seems different, and for a moment every blade of grass and every breath of air, and especially every act of human kindness seems precious. I wonder if this is the experience, or if this is, is close to what people feel when they turn to this hymn in times of sorrow. The deepest truth of all, then, the story behind the hymn that touches us most profoundly today is surely this, that we all still need grace. Not only did John Newton need grace, not only did the biblical King David need grace, but we all need grace. And is there not something hopeful and redemptive here? Grace is the only thing large enough for the sins of all humankind. There is a universal human dignity in the gospel message. We are all in Adam. We are all implicated in sin and we hurt one another. But Christ died for all, and the sprinkled blood still speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Today, Amazing Grace still has great meaning for many people, even if John Newton may not be as well known or remembered. If Amazing Grace is to be memorialized more than John Newton, um, I suspect he would think this is right and fitting. He did not see himself as a hero. It is our universal need for grace that matters most, and I think he understood that better than most. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Thank you.
Is it? Okay, good. If you haven't seen that, um, you know, run, go, walk, uh, get it, and, um, and watch it. Any further questions? Comments? Go ahead. Thank you very much, and Professor Heimarsch. Your comment from Newton that he was blinded by custom, uh, experience, and interest was very helpful. Would you feel free to apply that to us? Because you hinted that we can be trapped in the same way. Yeah. Um. I'm sure there are any number of things at the very nature of being sort of deceived and being morally self-deceived and these things are written in letters too large to read and you wonder where we are at the end of the supply chain. It might not be the sugar in our tea, but are we at the end of another supply chain that we are complicit in um, the evil that's happening elsewhere in, uh, in wrongdoing. And um, there's, I think, many areas today where there's a kind of moral blindness and uh, we can pick up and get our treatment of the weak and the vulnerable as a society. And, um, I think there's any number of issues we could identify if we thought hard. But I think it's good to, in a way, it's easy to exercise moral outrage over the past. But I think uh, Luton said what he realized when he came to an awakening, what he had done, I need to walk softly. And it occurs to me that that's, that's what we each need to do, is to be sort of self critical. something in tension with that swallow. 